Hey everyone, Joe Soto here. We've got an amazing show for you today. We have Dr. Donald Moyne on with us. He is the best-selling author of what Success Magazine actually rated as a top 10 book on sales called Unlimited Selling Power, How to Master Hypnotic Selling Skills. We're going to dive into all that juicy stuff here on the show. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Moyne before we get going though. You know, he, I, I, his bio is like five pages long, so I'm going to try and and summarize it in a few bullet points. Okay. He is a sales and marketing psychologist. Not, not doesn't, doesn't just call himself that he actually is one. I'll let him elaborate a little bit on that. And he has helped his clients book more than 9 billion. <laughs> That's a billion, billion with a B in new sales. And one of his special areas of expertise is helping his clients create powerful sales presentations and seminars. We're going to talk about secrets to sales, uh, giving good sales presentations here in a moment. Uh, his clients are, you know, all the big ones, right? So you've heard of many of the Fortune 500 companies that he's helped, including AT&T, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, General Motors, uh, Payne Weber, Toshiba, the list goes on. His approaches are practical and action oriented. I know I've been a student of his for many years, actually since about 1994, 1995, when I first started buying and reading up his material. He's one of those people that you tend to keep secret because his information is that powerful. You just, you know, you don't know if you want to share it with the world, but we're going to do it today. Stay right with us. We've got Dr. Moyne with us. I'll be right back with you. This is the Not Your Average Joe Show, where each week we bring you sales, marketing, and mindset strategies you need to get to your next level. And now, here's your host, international business mentor, Joe Soto. There he is, Dr. Moyne. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Joe. It's great to be here with your audience around the world, and I'm going to promote this show to my audience and my connections around the world also. Well, I am so thrilled you're here. We had a chance to connect before coming on here uh, live onto the show, and so I just can't wait to dive into some of these questions that I have for you that I know will help our audience. Uh, we have a lot of people. I mean, everybody's in sales, right? Everyone's in sales. Everyone's Lawyers, in sales. if you use persuasion, if you are in any way convincing someone, persuading someone, you are in sales. If you're a parent, you're in sales because you want to persuade your children to behave in a certain way, to follow certain courses of action. And your children are persuaders. They're selling you on a maybe a different course of action. I want ice cream before dinner. So it's a battle of who is the best salesperson. <laughs> I often lose that battle. Uh, possibly one of the only things that I didn't share with you prior to getting on here was that uh -huh. I have nine children and seven of them are in the home under the age of 17. And I'm losing sales battles all the time. So hopefully you can help me and other parents who are listening. And, well, Joe, and, that, that's some, Joe, that's something I cover in my $10,000 seminar. That's not, <laughs> not included here. $10,000 seminar. <laughs> that's the upsell. That's the upsell, folks. Awesome. Learn awesome. that technique. Okay. So I have titled this interview um, Hypnotic uh, Selling Skills. And, you know, I originally read Unlimited uh, Selling Power, uh, how to master hypnotic selling skills back in the mid nineties. And you had written it uh, around that time. I think early, early nineties, maybe 1990 was when it came out mm -hmm. and it's, it's timeless information for someone going, well, that seems like that was written a long time ago. I don't know who our listeners are necessarily. Uh, some of them are really young and some of them are really old. I don't care who you are. This is a book packed with timeless information. It's been on my bookshelf and never, has never left it. Like it's always been right behind me as a resource I can pull out and everyone will understand why here shortly. Give us a little background though on how you kind of, what, what prompted you to write this book and give us a little background on yourself beyond what I gave in that very quick bio intro of you. Okay. Um, well, I was, I'm very fortunate, folks. Um, a lot of you here, because you know Joe, who's an expert in neuro linguistic programming or NLP, um, you know about neuro linguistic programming. So you're blessed. Uh, I was very fortunate because as an undergraduate, I attended the University of California at Santa Cruz where Richard Bandler and John Grender, these two geniuses, created a whole new field of, a whole new way of looking at human behavior, human thought, human cognition, human perception. 
and the system was called neural linguistic programming. When it first developed, it was called the meta model, and that evolved into NLP. So I was a fellow student with Richard. John Grinder was a professor of linguistics, and I was fortunate to be studying it from the very beginning. My interest was always in business because my father was a businessman. A lot of people had a strong interest in therapeutic applications, which is another great way of using NLP. And I worked my way through nine years of college as a salesman. I, I sold all kinds of things. Um, and when I was, I was pretty good at it. Uh, when I was in graduate school, getting my PhD in psychology, I actually made enough money to be able to buy a house in the same neighborhood where my college professors owned homes. And that, that kind of blew their minds. And up until that point, Joe, I thought my goal was to become a college professor because I love knowledge and I love teaching. Or I thought I was going to become a clinical psychologist because I was trained to do clinical psychology. But I started to do some business consulting and saw how much money I could make, how much fun I could have. And I, I decided to, to try to create a new field of psychology, which was called, which I named sales psychology. And I wrote the first ever PhD dissertation on sales superstars, these guys and women who earn $500,000 a year from sales, a million dollars a year, $2 million a year from sales. Most people have no idea about the kind of money you can make if you sell you know, luxury jets or if you sell, I mean, it can be even in a thing like if you are selling copper, it to huge industrial firms in China. You know, there are so many hidden ways that people are making staggering amounts of money in sales. I've worked with people in the insurance field who are making over $20 million a year. You know, a lot of folks, they kind of, they may think, oh, he, that person's an insurance salesman. You know, I'm a lawyer or I'm an architect. They have no idea how much money you can, and how, how many people you can help. Folks, it's not just about the money, but these people are bringing financial security to the lives of thousands and thousands of families uh, so that they never have to worry about money again. And so when I graduated, I, 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 my dissertation was one of the very few PhD dissertations that ever got published because most PhD dissertations are very boring. But some, for some reason, people wanted to read about sales superstars and the language patterns they use. My big discovery I spent two and a half years of my life uh, audio taping, and in some cases, I got permission to videotape sales superstars in action, and I used tools of psycholinguistics, the science of language, to figure out what they did, because many great salespeople are like great athletes. They can do it, but they can't teach it. Very yeah. few great athletes become great coaches, because it's two distinct skill sets. You know, there's the doer, and then to be a great teacher or coach, you have to be able to break a skill down into explicit steps to be able to put it into average people and raise their performance. So I built models to do this in sales, linguistic models. Start, I started with that and then I got into other things. And I started, as my dissertation got published, uh, I started getting calls from Wall Street and I started uh, commuting back and forth from Los Angeles to Wall Street to train uh, brokers on Wall Street. And this was in the 1980s, folks. This was the wild, wild west of uh, selling. If you ever saw the Wolf of Wall Street, it was a little bit like that. Not as crazy, <laughs> but almost as crazy. And um, it's now much, much more regulated. But I was, uh, you know, spending my, that's what, I was, that's what I was doing. I learned a lot. I learned how to raise money. That's another thing I learned from Wall Street. They taught me how to raise yeah. money. So I've also helped companies raise about $500 million. I've raised about $200 million for wow. people doing real estate deals and you know, building apartment buildings and things like that. And then I've raised about, helped companies raise about $300 million. I've got a big client I'm helping right now raise money for. Uh, they're a high-tech medical uh, They make operating room equipment for retinal surgeons, guys that... Oh do um, eye operations yeah. uh, and um, so that's just that, that's a little bit of my background right there I, I could talk a, a lot longer about it but let's move on to the I, don't, I want to talk about 
uh, things for the whole audience, not just talk about me. Yeah, well, that gives a good baseline, though, for where you're coming from, so people can understand uh, to, how serious to take this information. Because mm -hmm. let's let's get let's just tackle the elephant in the room, which is, you know, sales hypnosis, hypnotic mm -hmm. selling skills. Uh, wh what do we say to the people that go? That sounds like that could involve, you know, the dark arts or manipulation. Like that sounds a little bit. You know, that's tr that's tricking somebody into doing something. Is that what we're talking about? Or what is your definition of hypnotic selling skills? Uh, and then we'll give some examples. Yeah. Not That's not at all what we're talking about, Joe. We're talking about mesmerizing word patterns. We're talking about something that every one of you on this podcast, watching this podcast, you have engaged in at one point in your life. Think about a time when you have been incredibly persuasive, where no one could turn you down. You were, your presentation was irresistible. You've all had a moment like that, where you are hot, hot, hot. What you were mesmerizing, you know, hypnosis has three characteristics. Number one, it grabs someone's attention. Number two, it focuses their attention like a laser beam. And number three, it greatly increases suggestibility. So let me ask you a question. Would it be useful for you to know how to grab someone's attention, how to focus their attention, and how to increase suggestibility? Absolutely. Yeah, the answer, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the kind of language patterns we're talking about. When most people think about hypnosis, they think about Las Vegas hypnosis, stage hypnosis, you know, someone yeah. waving a shiny watch in front of your eyes and saying, you're getting sleepy, Joe, you're getting sleepy, you're, you're, you're drifting down into a deep, deep trance, and, and then tricking them into getting them to bite into an onion and to think it's an apple or, you know, some <laughs> other thing. That's, that's what I call entertainment hypnosis. It's yeah. fun. We all enjoy it. Uh, I know you know, how to do that. I know how it's done. I know, you know, you basically want to select the most suggestible people in your audience. And um, there's ways of identifying them, which I won't go into. But what we're talking about here are natural language patterns that every persuasive person in the world has engaged in. And they're used, who uses hypnotic language patterns in that book, Unlimited Selling Power, I write about Ronald Reagan, President Ronald yeah. Reagan, who uh, used hypnotic language patterns, not knowing they were hypnotic. Nine, all of this, the salespeople that I wrote about in my PhD dissertation, and that was my big discovery in doing this two and a half year research project, is that without even knowing it, sales superstars, sales champions use language patterns that are at their base. They are hypnotic, not to trick anyone, not to take advantage of them, but to communicate with them on a deeper level so that it, it, at some points when it's really working, it's almost like they are talking to themselves. You're using the logic, the value system. You're respecting their own values and talking to them in a way that, that really cuts through a lot of the clutter in language and it involves things such as storytelling techniques we've all yeah. used stories and metaphors and word pictures in unlimited selling power i identified the 10 most powerful types of hypnotic stories there hypnotic language is used by every religious leader every effective religious leader the pope uses hypnotic language yeah it's it's you know so it, it's um, it's used by parents it's used by children um if and it's used in songs if you like you might think oh i don't like that i don't i don't want to hypnotize anyone we all like music think about your favorite songs song lyrics along with you know the music um is com it, that the combination is positively hypnotic. That's what goes into a hit song. It's used by Madison Avenue. A lot of the techniques that Joe's familiar with, uh, you know, he and I can identify them. We see ads on television. We can identify the hypnotic language patterns that are being used. So it's going to be used. It is being used. The only question is, do you know how to use it? Do you know how to master it? so that you can reproduce the best moments you've ever had, the best days you've ever had. And that's why I wrote this book along with um, Dr. Kenneth Lloyd. And that's why Dr. Lloyd and I wrote this book, is to share these techniques with you. You know, th what you said was really insightful that I, I want to unpack for a second. Mm -hmm. um, everybody does some of this naturally already. 
<laughs> and still superstars, of course, do it more consistently, naturally. <clears throat> so if you've ever told a, like you were just saying, if you ever told a story and the person you're talking to was really into it and you had them really enthralled and really captured into the, your storytelling, you you had a moment of mesmerizing communication at that point or mm -hmm. hip hypnotic storytelling. And yeah, you have a chapter and I actually had it as one of my questions. I'm glad you went in down that, uh, down that path of, on uh, hypnotic storytelling and, and metaphors. Mm -hmm. And not only do you have the 10 uh, types of stories that you can tell, giving people practical mm -hmm. information to apply what you're teaching, but you also talk about kind of the hidden reasons and advantages to what makes the storytelling and hypnotic uh, metaphors work. But we all have done it. But what you said, which was the super insightful part of all of that, mm -hmm. and all of it is insightful, was that this is teaching you how to do it on purpose. And so you can kind of generate that and create it at will. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it because it becomes something you're conscious of that you can now do on purpose mm -hmm. until it becomes part of your unconscious competence more consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I want to say, Joe, is that you can be you, you know, you can be you, you can be yourself, you can be 100% authentic, you can be real, you can be genuine. This is not about putting on some kind of fake airs or fake right. persona. It's, um, it you know, reminds me sometimes, I've done a lot of seminars around the world on sales scripting. And I sometimes have people say, well, I don't believe in using scripts. You know, scripts are for phonies. Scripts are wooden. They're... And the point that I like to make is that there's really no alternative to scripting. The, if you study psychology, if you get a PhD in psychology, you realize that there's something called, you learn that there's something called glossolalia. Glossolalia is word salad. And that's something that maybe schizophrenic speak sometimes you you might call them crazy people but it, it just sounds like nonsense like someone says up down carpet light computer um clock you know it, it's just random words and none of us speak random words none of us speak glossolalia in some churches they, they have the tradition of speaking in tongues yeah. that's about the closest you can get to glossolalia but here's the point we all use organized words we use an organized collection of words. If you told your spouse this morning, honey, I really love you. You know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be married to you. You know, that could lead your day to start off in a really nice way and her day to start off in a really nice way. And on the other hand, other people have a different kind of script when they get up. Their script might be to just grunt or to uh, say, you know, I, why didn't you clean up the kitchen last night? You know, that's that's a script. It's an organized collection of words. It's going to get you a different outcome. Yeah. So we're, we're engaging in using scripts from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. You turn on the television. The first thing, everything on television is scripted. Every single thing on every show, yeah. even, even when people think they're being spontaneous, people are being spontaneous in patterns, in certain, you know, Carol has a different way of being spontaneous than Bob on the show. And if you actually saw transcripts of it, you can quickly realize these patterns. So here's, here's what I'd like you guys to think about is that since you're going to be using organized words, organized collection of words, why not use the most powerful, most effective, most enjoyable um, collection of words that you can use? And that is a script. What, I, what I've been focusing on for the last five or so years, and since the year 2000, I, I, Joe and I were talking about this before the show. I told Joe I stopped writing books. I'd written a bunch of books, but I realized I was giving away millions and millions of dollars of material <laughs> because I met people that said, Dr. Moyne, I made $5 million by teaching your stuff that you had in this book. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm still writing, but I'm writing for my clients now. Uh, in different marketing projects and things like that. But since you're going to be speaking in organized collection of words, you know, put, put some focus, learn a few techniques to empower yourself so you can make those organized collections of words as effective as possible. 
and they're going to be invisible. So that's what I've been focusing on for the last, actually the last uh, decade or so, is invisible scripts. So that when you use them, no one will know that you put any thought into it, that you actually may have written it down, practiced it a few times. Yeah. But all they're going to know is, I like you. I trust Joe. Joe understands my needs. Uh, he really, he's really going to help me. I found my guy. I found my woman. I found the person I've been looking for in this field. They're going to feel very comfortable with you and want to move forward. Yeah, this is incredible. I, I remember your book was the first introduction I had to sales scripting. Mm -hmm. And then I had seen other scripts that were out there because mm -hmm. I'd went into the world of telecom Mm -hmm. And I realized that your scripting and their scripting were completely coming from two different models of, of, uh, of, of application of what you were calling organized words. You applying NLP and your research into these sales superstars into the scripting uh, gives it that, that power. And I think, you know, I know that, you know, what's behind you is probably a bunch of binders of script books that you've written for Fortune. Oh, yeah. A 500 company. I think you've yeah. helped. I think you said 50. I think your bio said 50 of the Fortune 500 companies. You've actually done or helped them and consulted with them on sales presentations and or scripting. And so if these bigger companies are taking that much time to learn this from from you, how, you know, a small business owner or a independent digital marketing consultant or a small business entrepreneur should look at it as this is your opportunity to set yourself apart. You can differentiate yourself by doing this. We were just, mm -hmm. I was just doing this yesterday. Mm -hmm. I woke up in the morning mm -hmm. and I had a, a video that I was asking one of my clients mm -hmm. uh, to do um, mm -hmm. for a, a book funnel. Oh. And I said, uh, I'm going to send you the script mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't want you to alter it. <laughs> so he said, okay. And so the only part I let him have his own like customization to was where he tells his story in the middle of his, of the scripting. Uh -huh. And I sent it to him and he wrote me back and said, this script is fantastic. I can do it. And I said, great. So I said, now for it to sound like you, you might want to do it like 10 times, mm -hmm. right? Like say it like 10 times out loud on the camera. Cause mm -hmm. it was only a two minute, I think it was exactly almost two minutes. I said, you could afford it to take 20 minutes and record about 10 of these. And on your 10th mm -hmm. one, send it to me so I can review it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he did. And he sounded mm -hmm. very natural doing it because mm -hmm. you hinted on that too, rehearsing mm -hmm. it a few times. So you, you make it your own. It becomes what you come, it, it comes out of you and it flows naturally. And I think that's a lot of people's hang up with mm -hmm. scripts is they think I won't sound natural, which is mm -hmm. true if oh. you if you present them or you're reading them for the new for the first time, you know, even your own script of your own words, you may not sound that natural with. Mm -hmm. So exactly. Rehearsal yeah, is the key. One of the guys I met um, in my earlier in my career is Zig Ziglar, who I know is a hero to a lot of you. Oh, Zig yeah. Ziglar was like the generation prior to mine. And he wrote a lot of great books, folks, that you can pick up Zig Ziglar on closing the sale. And he was a combination motivational speaker and sales trainer. And uh, I met Zig in the recording studios of a place called Nightingale Conant, which is the recording studios that Tony Robbins used. Everyone, like in the 80s and 90s, if you were big, you knew you were big when you got invited to Nightingale Conant Studios to do to record a program. And Zig Ziglar was there at the same time I was. This was in Chicago. And I met Zig, and I, uh, you know, I was a, uh, one of his fans. And I, I was uh, complimenting him. And uh, he's also very funny. Zig has a lot of very, very funny stories. That's part of his entertainment. And I said, Zig, you know, before you, like, when you come up with a funny story, uh, how many times do you practice it? And he said, 20 times. And I said, even if you like, you, you know, you've got it nailed after five times or seven times, he said, I practice it 20 times. And I thought, wow. And it really convinced me. I was already a believer in practice. You know, if you want to be a great athlete, you want to be great in anything in life, you have to practice. If you're a surgeon, you're not going to say, well, it's my, it's my first time doing a gastric surgery. I'm just going to cut in someone's stomach. You know, you, you practice on cadavers, on models. Um, and we have to do that in sales. And yet, in it, it's a kind of a lost art in sales training because I grew yeah. up 
when like when i was trained on wall street we did a lot of what role playing and i I still to this day i do a lot of role playing with my clients they say oh i i know that dr moyne donald you don't have to talk to me about that i I, i've got that down and i say oh really let's try it i'll be the customer uh let's go through the, the presentation here um you try to sell me and they find out they, they really are not as good as they thought. And then we reverse roles. And that's how you really learn is by going through the simulations of it. And that's why, you know, practice makes perfect. That's how, you know, there's that old story about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. You know, you there's really no substitute. Um, and I hope to encourage you guys, if you get nothing else out of this, just to, you know, Practice your presentation a little bit more, um, because one of, one of yeah one of, one of my sayings is that your words can make you rich. People tell me all of you know I could sell more, Donald. I could sell more if my company just increased my commission. You know I would I'd work harder. I'd I'd, I'd sell more, or if they just had a better product. It's a little bit too weak. Like you worked in telecom, Joe. I worked for AT&T Information Systems and I developed presentations to help them sell million dollar phone systems. It was kind of like a whole private phone system. It gave you the power to bypass the phone company. And um, some people told me, oh, our equipment's not quite good enough. You know, Dr. Moyne, if our equipment was a little better, I, I'd be a sales superstar. I'd be like those guys you write about in your books. Or our service is not good enough. People complain about our service. <laughs> and really, folks, it's not, you, you can have the best product in the world. It's not going to sell itself. You can have the best service in the world. It's not going to sell itself. It's your words that are going to make you rich. The product won't make you rich. The service won't make you rich. They're all very important, but it's your words that are going to make you rich rich so spend a little a little bit more time working on your words because they do have that ability to make you rich yeah that's great advice i i think i i did this recently with um, a member of uh my mastermind program he's he told me i'd love to know your advice for this piece as well but he was stuck at the presentation piece he says listen i I, uh, I'm getting the appointments, but I'm not closing the sales. And I said, let's book an appointment with me. I'll be your customer. We picked out like a, a website of a likely customer of his. And I said, just pretend this is my business. So you can do some research ahead of time mm -hmm. and let's get on zoom and you present to me. Mm -hmm. And then I can kind of hear where you might be falling apart and getting stuck. And, uh, you know, the extra advice I probably should have given him would have been, you need to now need to do this like, you know, 20 more times with, mm -hmm. with your partner, with your business partner who he has or your spouse or somebody who will just sit and listen mm -hmm. so you can get your presentation down because he really was off the rails in his presentation. And it was because you're not prepared, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you think you are, but you're really not to your point. So what do you say to someone who might, you know, be in that sales slump right now? What other advice would you give them if they say, well, I, I am stuck, I'm not closing sales. Um, maybe I do get my presentation down, but something's not clicking. Wow, that is a good question, Joe. And by the way, folks, we did not rehearse these questions. No. I, I don't. I have no idea what he's going to ask me. <laughs> but um, that is, um, this brings me up to a whole other set of strategies. I call this, two, well, I have two names for it. I call it the instant replay technique. And I also call it your personal recipe for success. Okay. And I, I, I believe we've, we have all been superstars. Folks, you have all been a sales genius at one time in your life and hopefully many times in your life. And you want to go back to that time when you were really hot, when no one could turn you down and figure out everything you were doing in your life. And I mean everything. This is going to sound crazy to you, but believe me, this works. I mean, I've used this in my own life. I know it works. I, I've done this with probably over 100 of my clients. So figure out what was your diet like? What were you eating? Mm -hmm. yeah, believe it or not, that can have a, an effect on your performance. Uh, were you eating clean? Were you uh, 
you, you look at your coffee consumption, your tea consumption, look at how much exercise you were getting, look at how much sleep you were getting, what kind of music were you listening to, what kind of clothing were you wearing. I noticed that, you know, in the era of coronavirus, a lot of people, I was on a call with two of my clients yesterday who are trying to, I, I work with a lot of people in financial services. A lot of my clients are in insurance, they're financial planners, and these people were you know, uh, one of them is very successful in insurance. The other person wants to be successful. And they were both, ex they, they're doing all their meetings over Zoom um, or Google Meets or, you know, some other, uh, you know, on a virtual uh, platform. And they were both very, very casually dressed. And uh, they were dealing with, uh, well, one person especially was dealing with sales slumps. And I said, what was the clothing you were wearing when you used to be really successful? And they realized, wow. I was dressing up more because I was seeing people in person yeah. and we've all gotten to be pretty casual. You know, I haven't worn a tie myself. I'm, I'll confess it. You look at my LinkedIn profile. I've got a, you know, nice suit and tie on, but I probably haven't worn a tie in six months. I don't think. And, um, um, so I've got a lot, a lot of nice Versace ties in my closet that are collecting dust right now. But first, you know, you want to look at every little thing, your, your food, your diet, what was going into your head? Most important of all, what was going into your head? And a lot of people now, they're getting poisoned by a lot of political stuff because everything has turned political. Science is political. Everything's political. And you need to pull yourself out of that. And go back to your personal recipe for success. Listen to the music that, before your sales call, listen to the music that makes you feel great. Put thoughts in your head. Were you reading inspirational books? Were you reading motivational books? Were you reading uh, you know, Tony Robbins or Joe Soto? Or you know, what were you doing? And recapture your personal recipe for success and you know, do a little bit of extra work on your presentation because that's going to lead you to be really confident. Sometimes when I work with people in a sales slump and I say, you know, what, what's wrong? What's missing? They say, oh, you know, Dr. Moyn, make me, uh, hypnotize me, make me more self-confident, make me more <laughs> self-confident. And, you know, so, and I'm a very honest person. Sometimes I have, to, I, I have to turn up my BS detector and I just say, you know, you haven't earned self-confidence. You know, if you haven't spent an hour or two working on this presentation that you give 20 times a week, you don't have the right to be self-confident. Right. You know, people are surprised. One of the things that still shocks me is that people are surprised by the objections they hear. You know, they have that deer in the headlight look like, like wow, you know, I, I can't believe they just said your price is too high. My price is too high. <laughs> They've heard this a hundred times before. Yeah, you know, folks, if you've been in any form of sales for a year or two, you should. You've heard them all. You've heard them all. <laughs> and the only question is, how well prepared are you for the predictable objections you're yeah. going to hear? So, or the preventable. How how exactly. how well prepared are you to prevent them? If you already know what they're going to be, why have them? <laughs> exactly. Because you can bring them up first and take yeah. the power out of yeah. the objection. Yeah. And that shows tremendous self-confidence. So you, when you say, you know, if I was in your position, Mary, I would want to be asking about and then bring, it, bring up that thing that you know that they're going to bring yep. up. And sometimes people celebrate too early, Joe. You've, you've seen this. I've seen this weekend. They think, oh, man, they didn't bring up that tough objection. You know, I've got them. And then they're at the end of the presentation, and people use those famous last words. Oh, I want to think about it. I, yeah. I call, you call me back in a month. I want to think about it. And what you really should have done, because you know that they should be bringing up that objection, is just bringing up first, tremendous self-confidence. If I was in your position, I'd want to ask about blank. And they go, yeah, I was thinking about that. And then you can give them the best answers that you've ever thought of, the best answers your sales manager's ever thought of. Um, and by the way, interview other great salespeople. Don't just yeah. rely on your own limited experience, but pick the brains of um, your sales manager, uh, other great salespeople in your company, and even in other companies, and then add that to your your scripts, your, to, your, to your script book, to your written responses, and you are going to get better and better and better over time and, and also at an exponential rate. You know, your, your level of progress, your rate of progress is going to be much, much faster when you 
know, this is the mastermind technique of, of you, you bring in the best thinking of the best people. Yeah, oh, this is great. This is gold. I'm taking notes. <laughs> so well, I'm going to pull it. You're, you're, you're pulling some I, good stuff out. I have, of I have a separate notepad for notes, and then I have <laughs> my actual questions that we may not get to all of them. But this has been gold. Thank you for yeah. what you've shared so far. So let's let's talk about um, mindset for a moment. And you have a chapter in the book called "Unleashing the Power of Self Hypnosis," mm -hmm. and um, talk about what part self-hypnosis plays, what you mean by that, how can we use it, what's an example of things that we could maybe do that would be a practice of self-hypnosis that can make us better as salespeople or higher performers. Okay. Another thing I was not prepared to talk about. Let me uh, think about Well, that. you do talk a lot about mindset, but I, I do. It, it is, book. This and really is part of the mindset piece of the book. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, folks, I, and I've learned so much more about mindset. Um, it's mindset is everything. I, I think the definition we have of mindset, first of all, and this is something that's not in the book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bonus you. If you buy that little book for $16 or whatever it is on Amazon, it's not even in the book, but I'm going to give you this bonus. Um, mindset is everything. It's, it's the way you see the world, the way you experience the world. It affects everything. It affects the way you taste food, it affects your marriage, it affects your parenting. It, it's not just about business. It affects whether you exercise or not. I got up a little bit early this morning and I kind of programmed my mindset. I was laying in bed and I imagined what I do three workouts a day because you know when you get a little older, you've got to really take care of your health, folks. They got to tell you that. And so I was I was laying in bed and I was just thinking about the first workout I'm going to do. And I do that with barbells and it kind of gets me going in the morning and visualizing that and programming that in my mindset and telling myself how great I'm going to feel when I, I've actually got them right here on the floor behind me. When I, when I start, you know, lifting these barbells and I can feel the, this is where I go into the hypnosis part. I can, I told myself I, I can feel, and you can, you can do this when you're working out by the way, and you can get in a great workout. You know, we all like to stay healthy, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can say, I, I can feel the warm, healthy blood going down into my arm arms, bringing nutrition, bringing fresh oxygen to every cell in my body and my legs. And I can feel my legs strengthening and I can feel my back straightening up and I can breathe in fresh, clean air and breathe out old air. And so you can, you can go through this whole thing and it feels so wonderful. And there are other people who are exercising. There are probably a million other people who picked up some barbells this morning and they thought, oh, this is a drag. I have so much to do today. I'm wasting time here. I'm not into this. I don't feel like I'm not different, feeling different self-talk, different self-talk. And they put them down quickly. And I finished my whole little brief workout and you know, got on to, you know, to my day with, uh, with the great mindset. So it affects everything. How do you look at your, the people you're going to call today? A lot of you have a, a call list of people you're going to be connecting with. You've got eight Zoom calls today or whatever it is. And, you know, you, we all engage in self-talk all the time. This is remarkable, folks. But we talk to ourselves, which is a form of self-hypnosis, at the rate of about 200 words a minute. Uh, sometimes even faster, sometimes a little slower. And uh, so since you're going to be talking to yourself, the only question is, what are you going to say to yourself? Yeah. And I have a saying, which is don't talk dirty to yourself. And I, I don't mean four letter words. I don't care if you, sometimes I cuss at myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that can be a motivator. But I, what I mean is by don't put yourself down. Don't say, man, I really blew that. I, I was lousy. Or, or don't say things like this. I bit off more than I can chew. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be able to do that. You know, that, uh, so you, you, because if someone else said that to you, you'd probably slap them, you know, because they're yeah. tearing you apart. But when we do it to ourselves, we're, we, we're not as aware of what we're doing to ourselves. And, and then we're, uh, we're accepting it without no, realizing it. We would never accept that or take it from somebody else. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So mindset affects everything. And I've added another thing to it, which I thought I'd invented this. And I went on the internet and I found out that other people had been talking about this. But I, it was kind of new to me a few years ago when I when I thought I had invented it. But it's called, I call it heart set. Heart set along with mindset. Because for some people, mindset is just heady. It's just Okay, it's in my head. I'll say affirmations. I will program my visualizations. I'll program my body. But in heart set is really, it's all about emotions. And I don't care how smart you are. I don't care if you have an IQ of 160. Uh, you're, you have a, a, a graduate degree in engineering from MIT or Caltech. You're still at your core you're in the, you know to be human is to be emotional and that's a good thing you know that is a good thing uh when we get married we don't marry someone for a, a bunch of logical reasons we and, and even most most purchase decisions are made based yeah. on emotion they're made primarily based on emotion and then we later very quickly justify them with logic so it's a combination of those two but uh, as you're looking to your uh, the people you're going to call later today, the people you're going to touch, the people you're going to connect with, you want to get your heart in the right place and you want to say things about them. Let's say it's a brand new person. So what I like to say is, if nothing else, I'm going to make a new friend. I'm going to make a new friend today. Now, I'm going to leave the door open to another conversation. Um, I work with people. I worked with someone last Saturday who had extreme call reluctance. And I said, well, uh, I had him go inside himself and I said, describe for me what it's like when you think about the people you have to call today or have a Zoom meeting with. And he said, it's like World War Three. That, that was those <laughs> inside his head. Words. Yeah, inside his head and, and his body. He said, I just don't feel like doing it. I will do anything except that. I'll, I'll straighten up the office. I'll sharpen pencils. I'll file papers. And then I get into it. And so I said, and I, I completely reframed it as making friends because this, he's relatively new to sales. He's a super achiever in some other field. And his company took a chance on him and hired him. He's a great guy. Um, but he has a big fear of selling. And he, so he framed everything as selling, selling, selling. It was super high anxiety. And I said, you're just making a friend because the first step, and any sales call is to build rapport, you know, yeah. build trust, build rapport. And he called me back late in the day and he said, you know, this, he only made a few calls. It was Saturday, but he said, um, you know, this has been a breakthrough for me because I'm now, I, it's not a big anxiety attack, you know, when I start to make a call. So folks, you want, you definitely want to be aware of your mindset and your heart set because it affects everything. And when you look at sales encounters as making friends and look at the, look at it also as helping people that sales is service sales is delivering yeah. value you can have a lot more fun with it and a lot less anxiety uh, this is great what a great you know i i don't want to stop we've already gone a few minutes over okay uh, i can tell my the, the sun just came out and now my camera is like having a hard time adjusting to this um i love that and i love the reframe of making friends i think that's going to help a lot of people who listen to this and uh, later on in the podcast or watch this later on uh in the archive show who have call reluctance to to rethink your approach that you're not selling you are initially just making friends you're building that initial trust and relationship mm -hmm. and and seeing where it can go from there mm -hmm. and the rest of it is is uh we'll take you know depending on how prepared you are we'll take its only we'll take its natural course mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to dive into some other things but if you'd be my guest again in another time i'll bring you back are you, i'd are you, love to i would love to have back. you back Yes, I'd love to. And I would love to dive a little bit more into, uh, you know, asking the right type of hypnotic selling questions. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, how to deepen rapport. So we have a lot of things to go to go into next time. Uh, doctor, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for being such a, a, uh, a waterfall of, of wisdom for us. I really appreciate it. Okay. And I know well, I've, I've enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. And folks, uh, let's connect up on LinkedIn. I'm on. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. This is. It's the only thing I'm on. I just joined a, a one year and one month ago, but I've got six thousand seven hundred great connections. Uh, I'm Dr. Donald Moyne. If you're in sales, if you own a business, if you're raising money, 
I can help you raise money. And uh, let's connect up. Let's keep the community going. Thank you, Joe, for this opportunity. I look forward to the next one. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll make sure to put his book in the show notes and linked below in the comments. So make sure you uh, cl- check it out, pick it up, pick up a copy and then buy a few copy for your people on your sales team, people that you care about, anyone in business. And uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback on the show. Doctor, I'll be right back with you, but everyone else, I will see you next week. Tune in next week for the Not Your Average Joe Show with international business mentor Joe Soto.